Hello everybody, my name is Marcus. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be going over some basic vulnerability management uh, concepts. I'm going to be using the Qualys platform to focus on the vulnerability management. I'm also going to briefly touch on threat modeling for which I'm going to use this open source tool called Threat Dragon. And let's just jump right into it. But before I do, I would just want to say I've been talking for 10 minutes straight and wasn't, I did not have my headset on. Quite unfortunate, so I'm starting over. All right, so first I'm going to jump into the scans that I did. So I did two scans already, and I'm just going to show the results. So the first scan was a basic unauthenticated scan, and it only picked up 68 vulnerabilities. So the unauthenticated scan is the type of scan that uh, someone without authorized access to a machine would have, meaning they don't have credentials. So if you have some open ports, that's pretty much all they, they can see by trying to scan your machine. So if I go down, you see I have uh, SSH port 22 open on these boxes. So it's displaying some vulnerabilities related to SSH and NetBIOS because those ports are open so of course it can see it. If I had those ports closed there'd be uh, even less results. So for the authenticated scan uh, there's way more. There is 456 vulnerabilities. That, now this is uh, for four devices. Uh, three devices actually. And I'm gonna jump over to the huge list here and we can see that the majority of these vulnerabilities are with the Windows Server 22 domain controller because I downloaded and installed this server and didn't do any updates so I guess they give you an image or uh, they give you an ISO that's from 2022 I don't know but um, <clears throat> So I got a huge list. Most of these vulnerabilities I could resolve just by doing updates, so I'll probably go do that. Um, but what I would do is if I'm if this was like if I was actually at work, I would go through this and just see what see what is low hanging fruit. And pretty much most of these are low hanging fruit. And then you also want to look at some that are I don't want to say inaccurate, but don't really apply to your environment so for instance this vulnerability here administrators accounts password does not expire well for one this is my lab environment so I don't care but if it was my real environment um, okay do I want my admin password to expire on my main server I'm not sure about that so I'm just gonna go into the uh, vulnerability to check the details and I'm gonna go to if you go to general information it'll tell you a solution so for here I've already read this before but it says for domain controllers the password does not expire since the checkbox is grayed out you can't make it expire so you would want to take this vulnerability since you can't resolve it ever for that specific machine, uh, the domain controller, you want to basically uh, ignore this vulnerability so it doesn't keep popping up on your scan. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and now run some updates on my Windows box, rerun the scan to see how much uh, is remediated just from simply doing updates. Alright, so here we are. I finally got around to recording the second part of this and I have rescanned the domain controller server and we can see that it now has only 16 total detections as opposed to the 90 or so detections that I had on the first scan before I did any updates. So this should illustrate the importance of simply keeping your devices up to date that that can simply that can alleviate most of your issues right there so as i'm looking through this list 
I can see that most of these listings are due to configuration, I don't want to say issues, we will say suggestions. So for instance, a lot of the default names are popping vulnerabilities. So the built-in guest account, not renamed. Um, I'm never going to use a guest account, so it's just going to be permanently disabled. Why would I ever have a guest account on a server? So that could be something. I mean, maybe I can rename it just for the heck of it, just to get it off, or just ignore the vulnerability. And what else was the default name? Um, what do we got here? Windows user accounts with unchanged passwords. I haven't created any accounts on my domain controller, so it must be referring to default accounts. Otherwise, I don't I don't know what it would be referring to, but that would be easy enough to fix. Just go through and change the passwords on all the default accounts just to get rid of the vulnerability. And if you don't use the account, just make it a crazy long password and then just disable the account. Just get rid of it altogether. Um, so yeah, most of the stuff looks like if I just tweak the configuration, it'll fix the problem or, or I can determine if it's a problem or not, depending on my environment. So one vulnerability that I thought was interesting was towards the bottom, the Microsoft Win Verify Trust Signature Validation Vulnerability app. I don't know what that is. So I'm sure if you are in charge of looking at vulnerabilities like this, there's going to be a lot of stuff on here. You just don't even know what it is. So, of course, if you look at the details, you can learn some more. So, I've already looked at this about 10 minutes ago. So, it seems to be referencing some registry keys. It still doesn't make sense to me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look some more. And I know that in Qualys, if I click on general information, I can see that there's a solution. So I'll just go right to the solution, take the guesswork out of it. And it says customers are advised to refer to Win Trust Signature Validation for further details. Okay. So I'm going to click this link. Wow, that was so quick. And it takes me to the Microsoft vulnerability page scrolling down all right so the recommendation in the recommendation it says to see the suggested actions okay I'll do that skip up oh, suggested actions is right here so oh, excuse me as I'm skimming through this, I'm trying to see what this is even talking about. So it's talking about authentic code signature, and it says it recommends customers to not put extraneous information in their WIN certificate structure. Still doesn't make sense to me. So then it says it also recommends that executable authors consider conforming their authentical signed binaries to the new verif verification standard. So that right there tells me that they're talking about people who are basically programmers. You're writing code and creating binaries and executables, and you're going to be signing your software. And so authentic code has something to do with that now. I don't work in an environment where people program anything. So to me, I would just ignore this. Um, that's my first guess. You know, maybe after some further research, I would change my mind. But as of right now, I'm like, I don't I don't see why this would apply to me at all. So, but for the other stuff, I would go through and see how much of this can be resolved just by changing a few settings and maybe resetting some passwords, changing some passwords, which I will not actually do since this is just a live environment. 
Okay, so now I'm going to tie in a little bit of threat modeling into the vulnerability management program. So this threat model is very basic. We have our threat actor, or just our actor, which is someone who is outside of the environment. And then we additionally have end users. I have that separate from the general actors because the end user would be inside of your network. And the end user might have access to resources like a email server or any uh, business business servers like a HR system or something like that. Maybe an accounting system. And then you will likely have a web server in your corporate environment. And the web server is going to be exposed to the internet. So the web server itself is going to need to be configured properly so that people can't leap from the web server to all of your other resources on the network. So typically you would have that segmented off and, you know, if the web server were to become compromised, you would want a an account to have like literally no privileges so that if they do get access to a to uh, an exposed account they can't just ransack your entire environment so in any case let's look at some of these vulnerabilities so for instance the guest account not renamed or the i think there's an admin account default admin account so the reason why these would be vulnerabilities is because Threat actors, typically what happens is if you have an asset that's exposed to the internet, it's going to be constantly scanned by bots. They're just going to scan all IPs. And if they see that there is a service open that can be logged into, for instance, for some, if, let's say for some reason you decided to have RDP or SSH exposed to the internet, right? They're going to try to brute force those logins. And they're always going to use common default names in order to try and do so. So an obvious default name would be administrator or admin. That's like literally always the default. So if you change the default to admin123 or something like that, that eliminates the majority of bots being able to even, like even if they had the right password, they would have the incorrect username. So it makes it, who knows, like twice as hard, a hundred times as hard for bots and hackers to get into your environment. So if you chose a really good name, a really unique admin name, they would almost never be able to guess that name. The same can be said for default ports. So most people will always use default ports, but it, it, it can be useful. For instance, if you have SSH on port 22, if you change the port to a random different port, well, you likely won't even, uh, that'll eliminate a lot of the bots from just from scanning your, detecting your uh, SSH server. So that could be useful as well. But that is how you would try to leverage uh, threat modeling. You would look at the th look at the model and say, "All right, um, how would an actor get access to any of these resources?" Well, if an external person, they would already have access to the web server to to pull the web pages that we're serving. But you want so you would want to make sure that your web pages can't be uh, compromised. You know, if you have backend servers and stuff like that. And another thing about the default names is if you leave the names default, maybe the external actor can't leverage that to access this server, but end users get fished all the time. That's why people even bother fishing because they know it'll eventually work. All it takes is one guy to fall for a phishing email and get his computer compromised. And then you use that computer that's in the network to act, to try and access other resources. So then, you know, you would use those default names and which a lot of people use the default names 
Like on my environment right now, the names are default. So if I were to get compromised, it's just that, that much easier for someone to just use the default names and maybe a huge password list and just brute force entry. So that is that. I'm not going to go too deep into that. This was a pretty basic threat model. And I hope that people learned at least something. And have a nice day.